Hello and welcome to Wrecked, the Michael Rechtenwald podcast. My guest today is an intellectual giant. He's the godfather of anti-wokeness and a hero of liberty. Dr. Gad Saad is professor at, of marketing at Concordia University in Montreal and the former holder of Concordia University Research Chair in Evolutionary Behavioral Sciences and Darwinian Consumption. Dr. Saad has received the Faculty of Commerce's Distinguished Teaching Award in June of 2000 and was listed as one of the hot professors of Concordia University in 2001 and 2002. I'm assuming that the hot designation was based at least partly on his stunningly good looks. <laughs> Sad was appointed newsmaker of the week of Concordia University for five consecutive years from 2011 through 2015. Professor Sad has pioneered the use of evolutionary psychology in marketing and consumer uh, behavior. His works include The Consuming Instinct, Instinct, What Juicy Burgers, Ferraris, Pornography, and Gift Giving Reveal About Human Nature, The Evolutionary Basis of Consumption, Evolutionary Psychology in the Business Sciences, along with scientific papers, some 75 plus, many at the intersection of evolutionary psychology and a broad range of disciplines, including consumer behavior, marketing, advertising, psychology, medicine, and economics. His Psychology Today blog, Homo Consumericus, and the YouTube channel, The Sad Truth, have garnered over 7.2 million and 30.4 million total views, respectively, as of when that was written, probably more now. His podcast, The Sad Truth, with Dr. Sad, is available on all leading podcast platforms and has yielded 7-plus million downloads since June of 2020. Dr. Sad is a leading public intellectual who often writes and speaks about idea pathogens that are destroying logic, science, and common sense. His fourth book, The Parasitic Mind, How Infectious Ideas Are Killing Common Sense, was released in October of 2020. It has since become an international bestseller. His fifth book, The Sad Truth About Happiness, Eight Secrets for Leading the Good Life, was released yesterday. I would like to also add that Gad is part of a thriving and growing email list of dissident professors and scholars, of which I am also a member. This list includes Janice Fiamengo, Philip Salzman, and Jordan Peterson, among many others. The list of, continues to grow as the academic casualties of wokeness mount. Gad Sad is also the person who has taught, the, has taught me the meaning of aposematism. I'm wearing a pink shirt in honor of this discovery. Gad is a fun-loving guy, so we're likely to have some fun here today. Hello, Gad. Welcome to Wrecked. How are you? Oh, my. Hi, Michael. What a lovely uh, introduction. I think it's the first time that I've been introduced with the use of aposomatic in it. So thank you for being original. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, I know you're really busy these days with your new book uh, having just come out. So thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate it. And uh, so I just want to jump right in here. Uh, as you know, this podcast is hosted by the Mises Institute. Uh, and I know you're very familiar with Mises's work, named after Ludwig von Mises, the great classical uh, liberal. The Mises Institute, as you know, is a uh, pro-free market and pro-private property think tank. So I'd like to ask you, what can evolutionary psychology tell us about the free market? That is, what is the relationship between what I guess you call market selection and voluntary exchange? Wow, what a good first substantive question to lead us off. You're not hitting me with, a, with an easy sort of thing to swing at. Look, uh, uh, in, individual differences is something that psychologists study, right? The fact that we recognize that we're not all the same. And so the idea of capitalism precisely recognizes that different people have different talents and the market will assort us depending on our abilities and our drive and so on. Whereas competing econo socioeconomic uh, and political systems, such as, say, communism, are antithetical to human nature. So in that sense, they are anti-Darwinian. They are anti-evolutionary psychology. E.O. Wilson, the very famous uh, 
evolutionary biologist who recently passed away, who was an entomologist. He studied social ants. He said, when he was asked about communism and socialism, he said, you know, great idea, wrong species, right? Because he recognized that, that communism uh, works well for a species that has all members of the uh, group that are equal other than the queen. But humans are not social ants. Some of us are taller, shorter, harder working, less harder working, ambitious or not, and so on. So, of course, freedom, the idea of freedom, the, the idea of personal heterogeneity is a fundamental feature of our human nature. And so, therefore, free markets certainly substantiate our individuality. Yes, that's perfect. Beautiful. Um, and, you know, that's funny that you mentioned E.O. Wilson because I reference him in my second question to you here. Uh, evolutionary psychology, uh, while I'm a very big fan of it, is considered anathema in many academic circles. I'm reminded of how Wilson was treated on college campuses. Your own work reminds me of his classic book, Consilience, by the way. How has your work been received other than the many, many thousands of citations that you've gotten? How has it gone over in general in terms of these other disciplines and uh, how their professors and students uh, treat you? Uh, thank you for that fantastic question. I love that you referenced uh, E.O. Wilson's book, Consilience, which I, I only wish more people would read because the concept of mm -hmm. consilience, as his book explains, is about unity of knowledge. The, so physics is more consilient than sociology, not because physicists are inherently smarter than sociologists, but because physicists create a coherent, consilient tree of knowledge, right? For example, in chemistry, you don't have people who are for the periodic table or against the periodic table. We agree, <laughs> we agree on that core knowledge and we move on. Whereas in sociology or in the social sciences, you can't even agree whether you know, there is such a thing as male or female and what constitutes male or female. So we're, not, we're gonna have a very quick bifurcation in our understanding of reality if we can agree on such fundamentals, which then segues into your, 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 the primary question, which is how has my work been received? It depends, Michael, on whether those who are evaluating my work come from the natural sciences or the social mm. sciences. So without, without too much generalizing, but I think it's a fair generalization, if someone is well entrenched within biological-based thinking, then they will read my work and say, oh, this is fantastic. Of course, it makes sense that we can understand economic decision-making and consumer decision-making without understanding our, the biological mechanisms that drive such choices. On the other hand, the social scientists, the, my colleagues in the business school, have historically been very, very uh, hostile toward my work. Now, the mm. good news is that science is autocorrective. So if you are dogged, if you are assiduous in building evidence in support of your positions, they will eventually come around. It might take a long time. So I do have many, many examples of people who, you know, this is now my 30th year as a professor. So I, I've seen the progression in terms of people accepting my work. So many of the people who, you know, five years out from my PhD used to think that my stuff was complete nonsense. What do you mean consumers are biological beings? That's insane. Now <laughs> are the ones who are inviting me to their university and saying, oh, it will be an honor to host you. So hang in there. If, if evidence is on your side, you will win the argument. Yeah. And you use this phrase or this term biophobia to refer to this, this kind of um, uh, disdain or um, kind of a problem with uh, the biological basis of our being. Uh, yeah, that's a yeah. very problematic uh, idea. And it's just unbelievable. Everything has to be socially constructed and culturally constructed and linguistically constructed or else it, uh, it's being, it's called reductionist and so forth. So that's all very good that you're doing this kind of work and have done it for so long. Uh, I think it's fantastic. Uh, Thank you. Now, I just want to ask you, when you use this term mind parasites, uh, are you using this term metaphorically or do you mean this quite literally? I guess what I'm asking is for you to remind us of what the term meme means Sure. and how memes arise and spread. Yeah, beautiful. So the, the term meme was introduced by Richard Dawkins in his 1976 classic book, 
The Selfish Gene, which I highly recommend for everybody to read if you haven't done so already. The idea behind the meme is that humans are inherently both a biological and cultural animal. So in the same way that genes propagate, memes propagate. What's a meme? Well, a meme is any packet that could be transmitted from one brain to another. It could be a jingle that I'm singing, you hear me singing it, you start singing it, while there's been a mimetic transfer. It could be you reading my book and therefore my ideas become mimetic and get transferred to your brain. I So the mind parasite is a somewhat different concept because a meme itself, its valence, could be positive, mm. could be neutral, or it could be mm. negative. But parasitic has a nefarious uh, connotation mm -hmm. to it. And so as an evolutionist, of course, I'm well-versed in studying how other animals behave to then draw links to humans. So if I want to understand uh, economic decision-making for humans, I could also study how other primates engage in uh, you know, distribution of resources, let's say. That's called comparative psychology because you're comparing human behavior to other species. So I started, as I was trying to write my last book, The Parasitic Mind, I wanted to have a framework that was grounded in, in the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I fell on the field of parasitology, mm -hmm. the study of parasites. But neuroparasitology, Michael, is is neuroparasites. So for example, Toxoplasma gondii is a parasite that can infect many animals, including human brains. But the most uh, uh, popular <clears throat> example is to discuss when the Toxoplasma gondii infects the brain of a mouse, the mouse loses its innate it loses its innate fear of cats and it actually becomes sexually attracted to the smell of the cat's urine, which is not a very good <laughs> sexual attraction to hold. Now, neuroparasites, what they're doing is that they are altering the neuronal circuitry of the host to mm -hmm. suit the reproductive interest of the parasite. So then I had, aha, I had the framework which I could then use mm -hmm to argue that humans can not only be parasitized by actual mind parasites, mm -hmm. physical brain parasites, they could also be parasitized by ideological parasites. Mm -hmm. Therefore, postmodernism, as I, I know you're, you're a big expert and you were in the humanities, so you know about these parasites. <laughs> yes. So postmodernism, social constructivism, biophobia, cultural relativism, militant feminism, are all these packets of ideological parasitic pathogens mm -hmm. that alter my capacity to adhere to reason, logic, and common sense. And so that's why I titled the book The Parasitic Mind. Yes, that, that's great. Now, how, how is it evidenced that, that these things, you know, de debilitate reason and, uh, and that they infringe on the capacity to think properly? I mean, how do we know that? Oh. Well, I, I mean, I can give you an academic explanation, but it's probably more vivid to just give you examples, okay? Yeah. So there was a famous case of a, Nor I think it was a Norwegian man who had been raped by a Somali uh, uh, refugee, a, a man who was raped by another man. Mm -hmm. And when, when, after serving a ridiculously minimal sentence, and then he was, the, the Somali was going to be deported. Mm -hmm. The Norwegian man was incredibly sad and blubbering and crying that he felt guilty that now the Somali guy was going to be returned to Somalia, right? Mm. That doesn't seem as though it fits with our evolved emotional system. Mm -hmm. Most people, if they're going to be raped, are probably not going to be filled with empathy toward their rapists. Yeah. But if I am somehow convinced by a cocktail of ideological parasites that I am evil, the West is evil, one of the ways by which I could demonstrate that I'm progressive is to engage in orgiastic self-loathing. Mm. Well, then guess what? I do feel really bad mm. for the guy who sodomized me. And I am, I am, I am guilt-ridden that he's going to lead a difficult life in Somalia. So that's one example of countess. I'll, may I give you one more that's very powerful? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, this, uh, this, other, this next example 
uh, I actually discuss in, in a bit of detail in the parasitic mind. So there was a doctoral student at, uh, I think it was Hebrew University. She was a Jewish student who wanted, you know, she's super progressive. Therefore, you know, the, the Israelis are evil, genocidal yeah. maniacs and poor right. Palestinians and so on. And so she wanted, as part of her, I think, doctoral dissertation, she wanted to demonstrate that there was rampant rape of Palestinian women by the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. So then she conducted the necessary research and to her utter dismay, found out that there wasn't a single documented case of rape mm -hmm. by an IDF soldier on Palestinian women. Now, did that cause her to revise her a priori hypothesis or her position? No. She actually then argued, Michael, are you ready? You're sitting down. She actually yeah. argued that look how much Israelis are othering the Palestinians and that they find them so <laughs> grotesque that they're not even worthy of rape. So let's wow. step back. This is not that satire. This is, this is a real doctoral student who I think won an award for that paper, if I'm not mistaken. Oh if she found that they had been rapists, then the Israelis are evil. If she finds that there wasn't a single case of rape, then the Israelis are vile racists. So mm. all roads lead to bigotry. No. That yeah. shows you what happens when you have a parasitized mind. Yeah, so it's something that overwrites what? It overwrites the evolutionarily uh, uh, transmitted uh, responses that one would normally have to circumstances, I would take it. Exactly. Okay. And it, it, it renders you blind to yeah. incoming evidence, that, right? A, yeah. An honest interlocutor basically says, I'm going to take a position, but if Michael comes along and gives me a deluge of evidence that suggests that I was wrong, then I'm going to say, hey, I guess I was wrong, and thank you for showing me the way, Michael. But if you are fully parasitized, then you are perpetually walking, la, 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 I don't want to hear it. Nothing you can show me could ever sway me away from my position. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's what happens. I mean, it's just a stunning uh, ledger domain that they pull off when you confront them with evidence. Uh, they'll even say, as in the case of your own family members you mentioned in your book, they'll switch sides just to prove you wrong. <laughs> uh, do, do you want me to mention that story? Because it's a, do you want me to yeah, explain yeah, it or sure. do you want to move on? To it? Uh, you can mention so it. There, sure. I think you're talking about the, the one with the ancient Greeks, correct? Yeah, that's with, right. With the you, family members? Yeah, yeah. You, you said they weren't Christian. Yeah, because they existed before Christianity. Right. So, so, so this family member says to me, you know, in passing, oh, you know, those ancient Greeks, you know, they were, they were those Christians, they were so anti-Semitic. And so I said, well, I'm sorry, I don't mean to correct you or contradict you, but those ancient Greeks were not Christian. No, of course they're Christian. What do you mean? They are Christian. I said, well, no, as a matter of fact, the way you mark the era is by saying BC, before Christ, before common era. You're literally marking it by virtue of them not being Christian. Right. So when that person then finds out that there is no way that they could win the argument, they look at me in an ultimate mind F thing, yeah. right? It's an epistemological mind F, if I don't want to use swear on your show. Right. And th that person looks at me and says, right, so I was right. I said that they were not Christian and you said that they were, right? Now, that person knows that they're lying. Yeah. That person knows that I know that they're lying, but yet is so proud in their, in their uh, unwillingness to concede that they play that mind game. Yeah, incredible. Um, you know, so... I I guess I just throw this out there. I think we know the answer, but uh, what do you say to these people who still suggest after this cultural revolution has utterly ravaged the social body that wokeness is just some blue hair kids on campus and merely part of a relatively unimportant culture wars? Yeah, well, that's a great question because that's exactly the type of response that I used to get. And I think you can probably uh, oh, yeah. attest to this because you too were an early person warning from top of the mountain about this nonsense, that's precisely the answer that I would get, which is, oh, come on, sure, that blue-haired person is there, but that's just some esoteric person in, in the humanities. W why are you exaggerating the seriousness? And the answer that I would give then, and I'm sure that you'd agree, is that 
yes, those ideas might start off mm -hmm. in an esoteric humanities department, mm -hmm. but eventually those ideas get into every nook and cranny of society. Mm -hmm. they, they, they define our HR departments. They become the prime minister of Canada. Yeah. So, so, you, so you certainly can't argue that it's just some esoteric campus lunacy nonsense. Right. Ideas have consequences. If you inculcate these ideas with students for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, they become our leaders and then we suffer the consequences. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And they're everywhere. And now it's in corporate America. It's in every, every uh, sector of society. And uh, it's become... Uh, completely, uh, it's completely revolutionized the whole culture. Uh, so we'll, we could talk later about what we do about that. And I think your 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 recent book, your forthcoming or recently published book, will hopefully address that, and we can talk about that. But um, you uh, wrote in the the parasitic mind that freedom of speech quote is the source from which all our freedoms flow. Uh, I would agree with that, and. Uh, but I would also ask you in the context of this particular podcast to talk about the relationship between uh, free speech, freedom of speech, which is, I think, primary, and the free market. What is the connection there? Well, uh, I mean, let's think about uh, advertising, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Advertising, you, you know, you, you always assume that for the free market to operate properly, the consumers must be properly informed and therefore, so that they can make the optimal choices using sort of the classical economics parlance. In order for a consumer to maximize their utility, they need to be fully informed. The only way that I can be fully informed if there is if there is a complete free flowing exchange of information, right? So when a consumer of a prospective consumer of vaccines, right? Mm -hmm. I want to decide through body autonomy, if we believe in that concept, which we should, mm -hmm. that I have the right to decide based on all available and relevant evidence for or against whether it should apply to me. If now someone comes along and says, no, you're not allowed to see on YouTube a physician who is questioning the efficacy of the vaccine, then I'm not living in a free market, at yeah. least the free market, the exchange of information. So of course, these ideas go uh, hand in hand with, with one another. I would yeah. also add that, and I, I'm not sure if you were going to go there, but for me, freedom of speech is a deontological principle. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that I've been constantly harping on mm -hmm. because it really explains many of the confusion that people have. Mm -hmm. There are two ethical systems, Michael. There is what's called deontological ethics. Those are absolute truths. Mm -hmm. So for example, if I were to say it is never okay to lie, that's a deontological statement. A consequentialist statement would be, well, it's okay to lie if it is to spare someone's mm -hmm. feelings. Now, when it comes for, say, the following, if your spouse asks you, do I look fat in those jeans? And if you wish to remain married, then you might want to put on your consequentialist hat yeah. and say, no, you never looked more beautiful. So for many, many things, we should all be consequentialist ethicists. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, when it comes to certain foundational principles mm -hmm. that that are at the root in defining our Western values, those are non-negotiable. Those are deontological mm -hmm. principles. So I never want to hear, I believe in freedom of speech, but I believe in presumption of innocence, but not for Brett Kavanaugh. No, you either believe in presumption of innocence or you don't. There is no mm -hmm. but. And so, yes, free exchange of ideas. And by the way, to, to, to demonstrate how committed I am to this the ontological principle of freedom of speech. I am Jewish who went through the Lebanese civil war yeah. and I support the right of Holocaust deniers to spew their nonsense. Mm -hmm. Not because I agree with them, not because I think they're saying good things, but in a free society, yeah. I have to have thick enough skin to even withstand the most grotesque falsehoods and nothing could be more offensive than Holocaust deniers. And yet I support their right to be believers. There you go. I mean, that's a deontological position. And you'll have no pushback from my audience on deontology, uh, because this is very, you know, um, the market principles that uh, the Mises Institute espouses has, is deontological. Uh, it's not consequentialist. Um, exactly. So, uh, 
Now, this kind of relates because you've written that the general idea that we must weigh our freedom of speech against the right of others not to be offended uh, is not a right. There is no such right. And I remember I, I, in a classroom before I left NYU, I, I, I told students, there is no right not to be offended. Several students, mostly women, objected. Uh, so where did they get this idea that there's a right not to be offended? And how did this spread? Well, you're right. Well, I think it comes from a conflation between the highest ideal being truth and reason or feelings, mm -hmm. right? So, it, yeah, so right. if for right, exactly right. So, so if the objective function that I'm trying to maximize is to minimize hurt feelings, then there are all sorts of things that I should never say on campus. Right. On the other hand, if the objective function that I'm trying to maximize is the dogged pursuit of truth, then that dogged pursuit must be pursued irrespective of who might be hurt by that story. Now, let's take it in a concrete sense. If I am a physician and you come to me and you're 50 pounds overweight, what does the Hippocratic Oath tell me that I should do? Should it be that I say, hey, you need to lose weight but they, because there are endless downstream negative effects to being heavy, or should I be saying, hey, weight is a social construct. You're healthy at <laughs> any weight. People will love you at any weight. Well, guess what, Michael? As you know, yeah. the fat uh, acceptance movement, the body positivity movement is the latter, which basically mm -hmm. says once you medicalize obesity, you are yeah. hurting people's feelings. And so, no, I, as a physician, I am guided by the deontological principle of always telling the patient the truth. Yeah. Being heavy has many downstream effects, and if your feelings are hurt, so be it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you chronicle cases of deplatforming on university campuses. I just wanted to point this out. You missed one big one, and that is when I had uh, a class canceled by Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York, when I invited Milo Yiannopoulos to speak to a 14, a whole class of 14 students, he actually canceled my class, called NYU, and had the class shut down. The mayor of New York. Uh, wow. So, this was, yeah. was that close to when, before you left, or was it many years ago? Before I left, this, it precipitated my leaving, uh, because what it did is brought NYU back to the table, because uh, they thought... I thought, well, you know, if they're going to, uh, back to the negotiating table, if they're going to, uh, they thought maybe if he's going to have Milo Yiannopoulos, who knows who he'll, he'll invite next. So let's offer some money, you know, and get this over with. Uh, so that's basically what happened. <laughs> well, have you, if I may ask you, I, I know you're asking me questions, but if you don't mind me turning the table. Yeah. Uh, now, having been out of NYU for a few years, do you yeah. have any sense of regret or is there a complete thousand pounds off your back? That's a great question. Okay, so I miss certain things about teaching uh, and uh, even academic research. I still write consistently, but uh, the whole, uh, you know, academic enterprise is so corrupt and destroyed and rotten to the core that I don't really miss it. And Frankly, I'm doing better as a free market intellectual than I did as a NYU professor. NYU is in the middle of New York, which is one of the most expensive cities on earth. They, uh, you know, they didn't pay that well. It wasn't that great of a job when you come down to it because of the cost of living and, and so forth. So I, I made a market choice, and I think I made the right one. More power to you, sir. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about uh, social media a little bit, if we might. Uh, sure. I've argued that the Google, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, they're, they're state apparatuses, given that, uh, especially in the case of Facebook and Google, their startup funding actually came from the state. And given that, as the Twitter files and the recent Missouri versus Biden case have shown us, they regularly collude with the government. What do you reply to those who say, but these are private companies. They can censor whatever, whoever they want. Well, I, I specifically address that position in the parasitic mind. And never, even if it weren't that they received the startup funding from the government, which you stated, mm. even if they yeah. had been fully private, 
that yeah. still would not be a compelling argument to me because freedom of speech is is part of the ethos of a culture, right? Mm -hmm. So, so. So the fact that you are a private company doesn't imply that you can violate certain deontological principles on which the mm. entire society is built, right? I mean, okay. I don't know if this is a good analogy, but I can't murder someone within the private property of my private company and then argue, hey, but that that's private territory. So, so th <laughs> that deontological argument of murder is illegal doesn't apply in my company. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure if that's a perfect analogy, but you yeah. get the point. So the idea yeah. that, look, look, all of these social media companies, as I state briefly in, in The Parasitic Mind, have more collective power on us than all dictators throughout history put together. They decide mm -hmm. what we see, what we can say, what we can't say. So to argue that they're just private, innocent, you know, uh, what what do they call it? Uh, they're not publishers, but they're what? What what is the? What uh, is they're the not publishers. Between? They're just uh, forums or they're, they're forums, yeah. right? They're nonsense, yeah. right? I mean, even someone like me who is so doggedly free speech, and I say this, I, I don't know if I if it was pragmatic of me to do this or whether I should be ashamed for having done so, but I've admitted it on previous shows, and I'll admit it here. I remember when uh, Matt Ridley, I don't know if you remember him, you know who that is. He's an evolutionary biologist. He was in the House mm -hmm. of Lords. He wrote a book recently with uh, a, a co-author, her, her name escapes me, which was one of the early books arguing for the lab leak theory for the COVID mm -hmm. virus, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, right. And, and right. he had been on my show a few times. He, he even uh, was someone who was one of the endorsers of the parasitic mind. So his people had reached out to me and said, this was during the COVID uh, era. Yeah. And his people said, hey, he, they, would, they would love to come on your show and, and discuss the book. And I said to them, I guess, frankly, I don't think I have anything to be uh, ashamed of, but I said to them, look, I'd be happy to host you on my show because you know I have hosted every single person who whom no one else wanted to mm -hmm. host. So I'm certainly not afraid to do so. But pragmatically speaking, this is what's going to happen. Our chat is going to disappear and yeah. I'm going to get at the very least, a strike against my channel. At the very right. worst, my channel will be removed. Mm -hmm. So does it pragmatically make sense for me to host you when we already know it's going to be for naught, it's going to be a waste? But just the fact that I had to engage in that calculus in the 21st century yeah. as a professor really shows you how bad the zeitgeist is. Yeah, it does. It shows you how bad. That's why I wrote the book Google Archipelago, because that's basically what we're dealing with. Uh, exactly. Uh, you you mentioned in the book, uh, you know, and you have a very large social social media footprint, uh, but there are people that confuse the right of speech, uh, free speech, with the compulsion to listen to speech, uh, as if uh, and suggest that as if blocking a Twitter user as a uh, free speech absolutist makes you somehow a hypocrite. Uh, what what do you say to these people? Oh, it, 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 you can't, it, this, this upsets me to no end, right? Because someone is insulting me, goading me for, you know, five straight days and I'm staying calm and cool. And then finally I just say, I've had enough and I block them. Then they go to some other burner account and they say, look what a fraud and hypocrite Gatsad is. He's a free speech <laughs> absolutist, yet he, he, you know, he violates my freedom of speech. I mean, it is at the level of intellect of a antiquated toaster to be <laughs> so idiotic, right? I mean, yeah. do you not see that I have a right to walk away from you? That doesn't violate your right to free speech, but you're right. It's a common theme that comes up every time I block someone. It's insane. And, and it really it really uh, goes to the point of like these uh, leftists who suggest, you know, they're being injured by speech, but no one told them they had to attend to it at all. No one told them that they had to go. No one said they had to subject themselves to anything. So it's yeah. really, in, it's insane. Um, let's go to some things about the academy a little bit more. Uh, sure. this, this idea of other ways of knowing, which must drive you as a scientist completely crazy. I studied this nonsense in uh, the field of science studies, so-called, really a misnomer, if there ever was one. 
Uh, and uh, speaking of the Mises Institute, Ludwig von Mises, whom you cited in your book, uh, argued that, you know, he coined the term rather polylo polylogism to refer to this folly. Uh, that is, he captured this notion that knowledge claims, uh, that, that, this claim rather, that knowledge is based on the, uh, is, is veridical based on the idea, uh, identity of the knowledge claimant. Uh, this is ab absolutely rampant today, this polylogism. Uh, and, and you see it, by the way, it, racial. So there is a black mind, there is a white mind, but you yeah. also see it in, say, Marxism. Right. There is a proletariat mind and there is a bourgeois mind, right? So it's exactly to that point. Depending on the identity of the person either processing the information or promulgating the information, you get different truth claims. That's insane. Then what is science? Exactly. I mean, this is so. Really, this is a, a an ultimate subjectivism, right? I mean, this, 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 and then it really comes down to a, an, an epistemic nihilism because you can't really have any claims that are true when it's utterly based on the subject rather than the object of knowledge. Um, this just completely invalidates objective knowledge. Exactly right, and I, I call it so. You can certainly call it epistemological nihilism. I think you called it, which I've also used the term nihilism. I call it actually intellectual terrorism, right? And I draw the <laughs> yeah. analogy here between you know the the nine eleven hijackers flew planes onto buildings. Well, postmodernists fly built, uh, planes of bolt onto our edifices of reason, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's exactly what you said. H how could I wake up in the morning as a scientist and say that there are truths and regularities in the world that I can try to uncover if I think that it's all completely shackled by subjectivity, right? Now, it's important, though, to remind people that science operates in provisional truths, meaning mm -hmm. that which we thought was true 300 years ago, mm -hmm. we do have the epistemological humility to say, oh, well, that was no longer true. We now have a new truth position. Mm -hmm. But we do operate under the premise that you and I can agree on some truths. Take, for example, yep. my, my first degree was in mathematics and computer science, right? Well, mathematics is defined by the fact that there are axiomatic truths, Right. Yeah. So to the, and I remember, and I think it was 2016 or 2017, Michael, using one of my satirical, you know, clips, I introduced satirically the new field of social justice mathematics, <laughs> where I basically argued we shouldn't use, you know, marginalizing words like irrational numbers because that marginalizes mental health. And I just did a whole bunch of stuff. Right. And I, I had many mathematicians write to me and say they just sit and watch this and crack up laughing. Well, guess what? That which was satirical six, yeah. seven years ago when I released that clip is now reality in many yep. of these science studies bullshit fields. Yeah, absolutely. This has become reality. So you were very prescient there. Uh, and, uh, you know, speaking of uh, postmodernism and science studies, which I think is probably perhaps the most pernicious manifestation of postmodern theory, uh, brings me to the Sokol hoax, which you've written about and I've written about as well. And for the benefit of those who may not know about the Sokol ho hoax, I'll briefly recap it. So this NYU physicist named Alan Sokol submitted a parody to Social Text, a respected critical theory and cultural studies periodical. The article he wrote entitled Transgressing the Boundaries Towards a Transformative Hermeneutics of Quantum Gravity. I can almost not read this without laughing. The article suggested that quantum gravity is a social and linguistic construct and that one could understand quantum mechanics with postmodern theory. Sokol satirically criticized his fellow scientists because they accepted, quote, the dogma imposed by the long post-enlightenment hegemony over the Western intellectual outlet, outlook that there exists an external world whose properties are independent of any human being and indeed of humanity as whole, as a whole. In Quantum Gravity, he wrote, the space-time manifold ceases to exist as an, ob an objective physical reality and, quote, existence itself becomes problematized and relativized. So littered with jargon and excessive citations uh, to postmodern theorists and signaling this radical relativism and extreme subjectivism and skepticism with every turn of phrase. 
Sokol's essay mimicked science study so successfully that social text ran the piece. And then, of course, Sokol revealed the hoax in lingua franca. And interestingly, uh, Andrew Ross, who was one of the editors of Sokol Hoax, of, of, this, of the, of the uh, social text, I, I mean, he suggested that earlier he had said science studies would never deny the, the reality of gravity. But then he ended up publishing a paper that just did just that. It's one of the greatest uh, examples of eating crow in academic uh, history, I think. Although, uh, what's your take although, on this? Yeah, I, I was gonna, I was gonna say that when the hoax was revealed, you would think that the the postmodernists would be filled with shame because they've no. been no. It they only had to double down and say, well, this doesn't prove anything. I extracted relevant meaning from it. It's subjective. So, so that demonstrates how you could never adhere to the Popperian falsification principle, right? Nothing, like, there's no nothing, way nothing for me falsifiable. to offer you exactly. I can't falsify your position, and therefore you're operating into in the realm of non-science. Absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, Stanley Fish, I'm sure you're a fan. <laughs> he came to the defense. Of course, he knew nothing about either science or so-called science studies, yet he rushed to condemn this as an unethical exercise, you know. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's as if there was nothing unethical about postmodern science studies to begin with, uh, which completely, you know, uh, you know, transgresses the boundaries of of rationality and evidence entirely. So, yeah. I, I agree. Just one, one quick point, then we, we, we can move yeah. on as, as you see fit. Do you think, Michael, and I'm, I'm trying to think, I may have asked you that question when you had kindly come on my show many years ago, but in any case, even if we did, it's worth repeating to this new audience. Do you think that the, the, you know, the, the, the originators of postmodernism or the, the big gurus, Michel mm -hmm. Foucault, Jacques Lacan, Jacques Derrida, do you think in mm -hmm. the deep recesses of their mind they knew they were full of it, or do you think they actually believed their nonsense? Well, one anecdote sort of gives you some idea that uh, they knew what they were up to in some sense. Derrida, when he sat on the tarmac, uh, having landed in the United States, he turned to his co-adjutor in, uh, in de deconstruction. I forget his name right now. He was also a Nazi sympathizer, by the way. Uh, he said to the, his co uh, adjutor of, post of deconstruction, we are about to infect this culture with a virus. Yes. Which goes r right to your book, uh, exactly. right to the theme of your book. So they knew I that this was- I actually found out about that quote after I had written the book, and I was so upset exactly. that I didn't know about that quote prior to finishing the book. If you had read Springtime for Snowflakes, you'd have known. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to mention some of the viruses now for and see, just take a quick uh, take on each one of them. Uh, social constructivism. Social constructivism is the idea that we are born empty slates. We are born with equal potentiality, and it's only the unique life trajectories, whether it be socialization yeah. or culture or any other form of learning, mommy hugged me enough or didn't hug me enough, that then determines the person that I become, right? Nothing is based mm -hmm. on any biological imperatives. That's social constructivism. Now, I argue yeah. that I, I can understand, if I'm going to be charitable, I can understand why people could be infected with that idea pathogen. Because at its root, it's a very hopeful message, right? Because it basically mm -hmm. says, mm -hmm. hey, parents, any of your children could be the next Lionel Messi, Michael Jordan, or Albert Einstein. If only you can find the right schedule of reinforcement, to use a Skinnerian term, right. then they could be the next Lionel Messi. I want to believe that. I don't want to believe that my child is born with a lesser proclivity of being the next NBA star. So I just have to find out how to hug him or not hug him, and then he'll <laughs> be the next Michael Jordan. So at its root, each of these idea pathogens is rooted in a hopeful message to the detriment of the truth. Yes, it's interesting. They kind of vampirize on, on the very significant principles and then uh, twist them and turn them. Uh, I wrote that... Uh, you know, under the social constructivist idea, you could take a tomato and if you gave it the right cultural uh, and environmental uh, 
conditions it could turn into Herman Melville. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, second and third wave feminism. Right. So, uh, early instantiation of feminism. Let's say, forget about the burning your bra, second wave stuff, but mm. equity feminism is yeah. an idea that I think any reasonable person could agree with. So, there should be no institutional legal reason why men and women are not equal under the law. So, by that uh, you know, optic, then we're all equity feminists. Right. The problem with then radical feminists is that they say in the pursuit of that noble goal, let's promulgate the idea that men and women are indistinguishable from each other because that allows us to eradicate the status quo more easily. Mm -hmm. So in the service of a noble goal, if I have to murder and rape truth, so be it. Mm -hmm. It's a consequentialist ethic. Yes. So that's, I think, the difference between, a, you know, a, a rational feminism and an insane feminism. Yes. Social justice. Here we come. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are many manifestations of social justice. For example, identity politics would be a sub variant of mm -hmm. the right. So, for example, mm -hmm. don't say anything against someone who is Muslim because, my God, those folks are mistrodden, right? It's, it would be wrong for you to further marginalize them. So, let mm -hmm. me give you a, a, a powerful uh, anecdote that speaks to that. So, I remember once on my uh, personal Facebook page, I had posted a clip of an Iraqi astronomer who was saying, you know, by the grace of God, we the Quran was correct in saying that the earth is flat and so on, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so I posted this clip to demonstrate what happens to even a scientist when in this case they are parasitized by religious dogma. Mm -hmm. So a fellow scientist who's an evolutionist wrote back to me not to say, my God, I can't believe that an Iraqi astronomer would take this position, mm -hmm that the earth is flat, she chastised me for uh, shining the light on that. Why are you making fun of this poor Muslim guy? Mm -hmm. Aren't they victims enough? So she wasn't offended by the bullshit he was promulgating. She was offended that I was shining a light on the bullshit that he was promulgating. That's part of the ethos of social justice. Yes, absolutely. So it's kind of also it's a kind of race to the bottom, right? So because the it's an inversion hierarchy, uh, it's an inversion hi of the hierarchy. So you got to race to the bottom because when the totem pole's flipped upside down, you're at the top. Uh, so the race goes downhill. Uh, <laughs> everybody's trying to gain victim status and to usurp the victim status of others. Uh, so what's what's the ultimate danger of these mind parasites? I think we, you've touched on it, of course. Truth is, of course, a casualty. Well, I mean, look, our prefrontal cortex makes us unique in the animal kingdom, right? The, the, the ability to reason and part of being able to reason properly is for you and I to have a shared space where we understand a common meaning. We know what male is. We know what female. I, I recently put up a tweet where I said there's been roughly 117 billion people who have existed in the Homo sapiens line since we've had Homo sapiens, 117 billion. All 117 billion until 13 minutes ago exactly knew what male or female was. But now we no longer know that. So what could be more dangerous than to take a sexually reproducing species defined by two phenotypes and to say, no, 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 there is no such thing. It's the end of reason. It's mm. the end of logic. It's the end of common sense. And so... I don't need to say any other negative downstream consequences. Mm -hmm. once, I, once I can't get a sitting Supreme Court justice when asked in a confirmation hearing, tell me, what is a woman? And you answer, I am not a biologist. I'm not equipped to, to answer that question. We're really in a bad spot. Absolutely. So, I mean, I think that the, the, the casualties are truth, uh, reason, uh, uh, Freedom. Uh, human dignity, right? Dignity, too. Yes, human dignity. Yeah. So let's turn now, finally, to your new book, which uh, was very much anticipated, the, the Sad Truth About Happiness. So how did you move from writing about these negative mind parasites to treating happiness? Where, how did you get from 
dystopia to s sort of a recipe for uh, 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 an improved uh, social condition and uh, personal, uh, you know, personal Growth. fulfillment. Yeah. Right. Well, th thank you for that great question. And I actually ad addressed that that the excellent question in the first chapter. So it comes really from my having noticed a, a constant reality that, that I would face in my social in, uh, media engagement. So what would happen is someone would write to me and say, how is it that you're able to always be smiling and you always seem to be playful and you do all this satirical stuff when you're handling such serious, you know, dystopian, as you said, things? What's your secret, Professor? So that, that's one, one source that led me to write the book. The second source is when I realized that often, so I've operated historically, Michael, in what's called uh, descriptive world, meaning as, an, as a behavioral scientist, I seek to describe human behavior without offering some optimal prescriptive, right? The self-help guru offers a prescription of how you should live. But then I started seeing that whenever I would post some prescriptive action. Oh, here is the way that I think you could lose a lot of weight. Having myself lost tons of weight during COVID, whenever I would post some prescriptive, unsolicited advice, that would be some of the content that would most move people, right? They would say, oh my God, you know, that, that one tweet that you wrote got me off my couch. I've now I've lost 32 pounds. They would send me before and after photos. And so I said, well, you know what? I, I'd never thought about writing a book on happiness, but I certainly seem to have the ear of many people. I seem to have the trust of many people. I truly am a happy person. Now, part of my happiness is, is the luck of what's inscribed in my genes. About 50% of your happiness comes from your genes, but that means that another 50% is within your own doing. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know what? Let me take a crack at, as you said, I've done the book on dystopia, on mind parasites. Let me complete the story by talking about positive mindsets, good decisions that we could make that could hopefully increase our likelihood to be happy. And hence that led to my happiness book. Excellent. Yeah, I often get this. You know, I've been uh, diagnosing and uh, analyzing the wickedness and uh, the pernicious elements, but the people will say, but what do we do about it? And, uh, you know, you, you know, you come to be, you got to be the answer man too, not just the, the Absolutely. diagnostician you got to be the, the prescri prescriber of the, uh, of the alternative. And I, I think that's great that you're actually following up on that. And uh, you know, so, well, before you go on, sorry, just yeah. one, one quick interjection, forgive me. Uh, I have found, no so I've only started recently all of my, you know, media tour for the, the latest book. And there is actually something quite liberating and positive. While I, of course, as we've been doing for this show, I, I love talking about all those parasitic stuff because they really are affecting our society. And so I'll, I'll never uh, waver from speaking about these. But there is something so uplifting about mm -hmm. the valence of the current book, which is it's all positive. It, it, it has no political aisle. It's a universal theme that philosophers have been talking about for thousands of years. And so it excites me to not only have to talk about all the dystopian things, but to talk about hopeful things. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I, I, I can't wait to read it. Um, so, you know, but there is something to the title, I, I take it. You do use your surname and play on the word sad. There's got to be something meaningful about that. What is... What is the sad truth about happiness in the sense of, be, you know? Well, okay, you're right that sad is a play on sad, S-A-D, whereas my name is S-A-A-D. But sad, if I pronounce it in Arabic, it's sad. Uh -huh. It has a guttural sound. It refers to happiness and felicity. So even my name mm. in Arabic, it, it's as if I was predestined to, to write this book. Excellent. And so... Take all that together, and you come up with that. That's title. very interesting. What a what an uh, what a conjunction there. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you know, you uh, not to bring up bad. I, I, I've noted that when you're asked about this, you know, you 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 display some um, discomfort because what you went through as a child is really horrific. Uh, it's incredible that you emerged from that, and it uh, you lived through the Lebanese Civil War. Uh, you were almost killed. Uh, it was a very, very seriously dangerous and horrific 
uh, thing that you uh, experiences that you must have had. How does this impact your views in terms of both the mind parasites and the pursuit of happiness? Oh, what an amazing question. So let me address first the mind parasites. What the Lebanese Civil War taught me is that a society that is organized along tribal lines, hence that's what identity politics mm -hmm. does, is not the way that yeah. you want to organize society. So the idea that progressives in, in the West are trying to view everything through the prism of your you know, tribal identity it, it is just not what, what makes the West great historically. Classical liberalism is individual dignity over tribal. I present myself to the world as God sad first before I'm yeah. Lebanese Jew or anything else. Right. Judge me on the quality of my thoughts, on the on my qualities, on my faults. That's how you should judge me. So that's what so that and that's why I discussed in, in chapter one of the parasitic mind my personal history because it allows me to understand what real victimology is, mm -hmm. what identity politics do mm -hmm. to society and so on. In terms of the happiness book, it actually has a profound effect on my level of happiness because I'm able to situate anything that mm. I'm going through in the, in light of what could have been had I not miraculously gotten out of Lebanon. So I'll give you an example. I actually mentioned this uh, just recently on another show. Uh, when I was starting my media tour now, and I, I'm also going to be traveling a lot, you know, I felt a bit of apprehension. Oh my God, I'm overwhelmed. I've got so I'm, I'm gotten back to back shows nonstop traveling everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then I stopped for a second and I thought to myself, are you really God sad whining to yourself and complaining <laughs> because a bunch of really interesting people are going to give you their platform to discuss ideas and you have a book coming next week? You're whining? Remember the snipers in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Remember what was going to happen to you. You, you faced death in 73,000 ways. So that life, ex tragic life experience mm -hmm. of my childhood mm -hmm. allows me to always call up that experience whenever I am mired in, in self, uh, you know, uh, whining, right? Yeah. Because I could always contextualize whatever it is that's bothering me compared to real issues that I should be worried about. And I'll tell you, if I may, to speak to that question, two, I tell two anecdotes at the end of The Sad Truth About Happiness that really speak to that, that question. So one, so I'll, I'll start with story one. David McCallum is someone that probably few people have heard of, but he is one of the most powerful guests I've ever had on my show. And I've had a lot of incredible people on my show. David McCallum was arrested when he was 17 for murder, and he spent the next 29 years in prison before he was exonerated. When he was on my show and we were chatting, I looked at him, and, I, and you could go watch this chat on, on my channel, I looked at him, I said, you know, David, I think you must be the reincarnation of Buddha because the way that you handle what happened to you with such grace, without any vengefulness, without mm -hmm. any hatred, you must be a much better man than I am because I would want to burn the world down. And then he gave me an answer that speaks to, to gratitude and contextualizing mm -hmm. your plight in light mm -hmm. of others. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, I have a sister who has been bedridden with cerebral palsy for much of her life, and yet she finds a way to smile. So probably whatever I went through doesn't compare to her plight, right? So yeah. that's story one. Story yeah. two is a gentleman who I met when I was a professor at University of California, Irvine. At the time, he was pursuing his PhD, studying the homeless community in, in that area. And he had immersed himself in the homeless community akin to how an anthropologist immerses himself in an ecosystem. And then, incredibly, a few years later, he became homeless, even though he came from a wealthy Persian family. So then I tracked him down and found a 2011 uh, story, which I cite in, in my forthcoming, in my in the, the happiness book, where he was asked, are you, are you happy? Are you upset? And he said, why would I be unhappy? I have a pass to go to the Newport Beach gym so I could keep my body healthy. I have a library card that allows me to go to the Newport Beach public library and immerse myself in thinking. I'm a moral good person. I have no reason to be unhappy. He was living out of his car. So mm. once you can, you use the, 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 
the trick of contextualizing your plight in light of worse things, then that quickly serves as an infusion of happiness. So to summarize, my tragic childhood has actually made me a happier person, paradox. Amazing. That's a paradox. That's amazing. So I, I take it that's one of the steps to happiness. You talk about some common steps. Contextualizing must be one of them. Exactly right. Uh, trying to live your life so that at the end of your life, you have minimal regrets is yeah. another one. Right. Uh, pursuing what Aristotle already knew and Buddha, which Buddha called it the middle way. Aristotle, Aristotle called it the golden mean. I call it the inverted U curve, which is too little of something is not good. Too much of something is not good. The sweet spot is somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. So in one of the chapters, I demonstrate that through a bewildering number of phenomena, that inverted U curve works. Mm. And, and so you basically, your trick to a good life is to always find where that sweet spot is. So let, let me give you one example. Yeah. Uh, perfectionism, right? If you're not the least bit perfectionist, then your work will suffer because you, ha you have no attention to details. If you are as I am yeah. on the wrong side of being too perfectionist, too. then when I receive the galley proofs of the book, I spend 4,000 years reading every single, because God forbid a comma is out of place. Well, that's suboptimal because yeah. I could have spent that time doing something more productive. If one comma is missed, that's okay. The sweet spot is somewhere in the middle. And yeah. I demonstrate in that chapter that at all kinds of levels, that curve holds. And so find the sweet spot. In another chapter, I argue that you should really immerse yourself in play. The chapter is titled mm -hmm. Life as a Playground. Mm -hmm. And I basically argue that even the most austere, serious pursuits should be viewed as manifestations of play. As a mm -hmm. scientist, mm -hmm. I'm engaging in the highest form of play, cerebral play. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for puzzles in nature, which variable connects with which other variable. I'm engaging in play. Even during the Lebanese Civil War, I couldn't help but instantiate my love for play. A, a very quick story. My parents used to tell me, if you play outside, don't pass this particular physical line because then that opens you up to the eyesight of the snipers who would blow your brain apart. So I knew that there was a literal physical line that as I was playing with my cousin, I should never cross. I, I cite a, a story of play that children developed during the Holocaust. So what could be more dire and tragic mm -hmm. than the Holocaust? Yet people, well, Life is Beautiful, the Academy Award movie, winning movie was about how a father was trying to protect his son in the concentration camps by turning the whole thing into a form of make-believe play. And so I, I go through these various mm. chapters showing that there are certain mindsets that we could adopt, all other things equal, that are going to increase our proclivity to happiness. Wow, that's just that's fantastic. I can't wait to get a hold of this. Uh, and I'm sure that people will really appreciate what you're doing here. Um, Thank you, I can't, I can't, uh, I can't congratulate you enough on all of your accomplishments. They've been quite incredible. I'm jealous, not really, because I know that it doesn't make me happy. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I had a couple other questions, but I think that you've probably already, you've already answered them in the course of this discussion. Did you have anything else you want to add to this discussion before we close it out or? Oh, I just wanted to thank you uh, for, you know, giving me the opportunity to speak to you. I'm delighted to hear that you are not suffering from any looming regrets regarding your decision to leave NYU. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you're feeling fulfilled. And uh, I hope that we can continue chatting uh, in the future. Keep doing what you're doing. You are a true honey badger, one of the original academic honey badgers. And so keep flourishing, Michael. And it's a privilege and honor to know you. Oh, same, same to you, God. Thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. You're listening to Wrecked with Michael Rechtenwald. Find more episodes wherever you get your podcasts and get more content like this on Mises.org. Scotty.